Good evening, everyone. Oh, goodness. Gosh, these lights are really bright. I warn you in advance. Whoa, we. My name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I'm very pleased uh, tonight uh, to address you briefly uh, on behalf of the Dartmouth Center's Forum, which is sponsoring uh, this event. The forum was founded uh, two years ago in 2005 by six academic centers at Dartmouth seeking to create common programming around themes of timely and educational import. The forum has now grown to 10 uh, centers and institutes at Dartmouth, and our number now includes uh, the Alwyn Initiative for Corporate Governments at the Tuck School, the Dartmouth Center for the Advancement of Learning, the Dickey Center for International Understanding, the Ethics Institute, the Hopkins Center for the Arts, the Hood Museum, the Institute for Security Technology Studies, the Leslie Center for the Humanities, the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy, and the Tucker Foundation. As you can see, the Center's Forum is a diverse grouping here at Dartmouth. Our various individual missions pull us in different directions, and yet we are all joined in the commitment to address issues that, like in our society at large, affect us all. Themes that we have addressed in the past have included religion and politics, and then last year, freedom and technology. This year, in conjunction with the Hopkins Center, which is doing a, a very outstanding program, uh, a, a three-year cross-campus community programming initiative, uh, all of us are focusing on the initiative of class divide. Social classes and the inequities that distinguish them <clears throat> excuse me, tend to be either overlooked or subsumed in racial and gender differences. Because of this, inequities of class can be especially pernicious. Even in societies like our own, where social mobility is quite flexible, class divisions remain salient and powerful factors in social conflict and political uh, division. Tonight's discussion of the working poor in America is the Dartmouth Center's forum, forum's opening to what we hope will be a very fruitful and enduring dialogue on the class divisions that exist here at Dartmouth, in America, and in the world. And we certainly encourage all of you here this evening and all across this campus to join us in this and future discussions as we explore current notions of class. And our presenter tonight uh, just could not be a better person uh, to begin this dialogue uh, this year. I have to say at the outset that I'm rather prejudiced uh, because David and Debbie Shipler are, are two of our closest friends for my wife and myself, so I can't be too objective when I, when I introduce David, but nonetheless. Um, David, I think as many of you know, is a Dartmouth alum, the class of 1964. Um, he is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and also a former correspondent of the New York Times, and that's where we met some 30 odd years ago in Moscow. His latest book entitled The Working Poor, Invisible in America, was a national bestseller in 2004 and 2005. It was a finalist for the 2005 National Book Critics Circle Award and the New York Public Library Helen Bernstein Award. It won an outstanding book award from the Meyer Center for the, Center for the Study of Bigotry and Human Rights at Simmons College and led to his receipt of awards from the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, the New York Labor Communications Council and the DC Employment Justice Center. David uh, has received a Martin Luther King Jr. Social Justice Award from Dartmouth and the following honorary degrees. 
Doctor of Letters from Middlebury College and Glassboro State College in New Jersey, Doctor of Laws from Birmingham Southern College, and Master of Arts from Dartmouth College, where he also served on the Board of Trustees from 1993 to 2003. He's taught at Princeton and American Universities, has been writer in residence at the University of Southern California, a visiting Woodrow Wilson Fellow on more than a do dozen college campuses, and a Montgomery fe Fellow and visiting professor of, go of government at Dartmouth. Please join me in welcoming David Schipler. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm old enough to remember when this room had a balcony where we would sit when we were hoping not to be called on. I'm glad they've taken that away. Uh, I want to thank Ken very much for this invitation. Um, and I'd like to introduce my wife, Debbie, who kindly volunteered to come listen once again to me talk about this subject. Uh, Debbie is a social worker who helped me interpret what I was hearing from people as I brought home their stories. And uh, she read the manuscript, and she's a very tough editor, let me tell you. So I appreciate her being here. And uh, <coughs> you know, when, when I was a kid, one of the favorite, my favorite things was connecting the dots. This is a metaphor you've heard a lot about, but I have a sneaking suspicion that I may have to explain this to the video game generation. Because I know this, these exist now, but they're not too common. There are these, there are these books. And each page had dots, and each dot was numbered. And you put your pencil on dot number one, you drew a line to dot number two, and then dot number three, and so forth, until this seemingly random array of dots created a picture. And we've heard since 9-11 how if only we had connected dot, the dots among the scattered bits of information that we had about most of the 19 hijackers, we might have been able to prevent the attacks. I think the same is true in understanding poverty. We need to connect the dots among scattered problems that poor families have and see their interactions in order to understand how poverty works. And you can't solve a problem until you understand it. So that's what I'd like to talk to you about this evening, if I may. Connecting the dots and seeing the interaction among the constellations of problems that people face. You know, the federal government defines poverty very simply. If you're a family of four this year and you earn $20,549, you are poor. If you earn a dollar more, you are not. But the poor families I spent five or so years with, going back to time and again, understood very well that getting out of poverty was more complicated than showing a passport and crossing a frontier. Because poverty is not just income. Income is a still photograph of the present. Poverty is also debt. Debt is a moving picture of the past that's carried into the present and burdens the future. Debt is just as much a part of poverty as income. I knew a man in New Hampshire who was without work for quite some time and didn't, didn't go to the dentist. He had no medical care. Every time he had a toothache, he went to an emergency room. And you know that by law, hospitals are required to treat you, but they can also bill you. And so he ran up a bill of about $10,000, which he could not pay. So much that when he finally did get a decent job as a roofer, which placed him above the poverty line, he had such a bad credit rating, the phone company wouldn't even install a phone in his house. So poverty is not just income. It's also debt. Poverty is a sense of powerlessness. Some would say a learned helplessness that prevents people from being able to anticipate the long-range consequences of their actions, often because they see no connection between what they do today and that action's impact. They don't feel powerful. They don't feel able or capable of changing their situation. Poverty is powerlessness. 
sometimes just a perceived powerlessness. The perceptions in this case become reality. Poverty is relative. A Vietnamese farmer who owns a couple of acres of rice paddy and a, and a water buffalo to plow is not poor in Vietnam. But a Mexican farm worker who is paid by the bucket of cucumbers he harvests in eastern North Carolina and who lives in a cinder block barrack crammed in to a tiny room with five other men is poor in America. Poverty is relative. It means standing at the edge of an affluent society whose affluence you contribute to, but which you cannot fully enjoy. So the working poor include the man who washes cars, but doesn't own one. The assistant teacher in a daycare center I met in Akron who could not afford to put her own two children in the daycare center where she worked. The woman I came to know uh, in Claremont, New Hampshire, who for a time filed canceled checks in the back room of a bank when she had in her own checking account a balance of two dollars and two cents. The working poor harvest sweet potatoes that you're all gonna, we're all gonna enjoy a few weeks from now on Thanksgiving. The working poor cut our Christmas trees. The fruits of their labor are in our lives every day, but we do not see them. Not fully, and even when we see them stocking shelves at Walmart or checking us out in the supermarket, they are not full people to us. We do not see their poverty, which is hidden in plain sight, to borrow a phrase from Edgar Allan Poe. And I think the reason we do not see their poverty is because they have jobs, and they wear their jobs as a kind of camouflage to blend in with the society's expectations of how people are supposed to function and prosper because we have a very important myth in America, a very important dream which says, if you work hard, you will prosper. Now, this is such a, an important myth that we tend to believe it. We tend to believe it. As Richard Wright said, and not Dartmouth's Richard Wright, but the other Richard Wright, he called this the truth of the power of the wish. The truth of the power of the wish. It's a very useful myth, as many myths in societies are. I wouldn't uh, be dismissive about it, because it sets a very high standard for us. And the gap between that myth and the reality is a gap that we yearn or should yearn to close. So it sets a, an ideal, this American myth, that if you work hard, anybody who works hard can prosper. The trouble is that there is another side to this myth, and that's the judgmental side. Because if it's true that everyone who works hard can prosper, then it must also be true that those who don't prosper are not working hard. And so this is a coin with two sides. The dream on the one side, the condemnation on the other. This is the American myth. Alongside this is what I think of as the anti-myth. The anti-myth in America is that all poverty is produced by the society's failures, by the failures of public education, private enterprise, government services, and so forth. And I found uh, that, as I thought about this, as I went out and spent time with families, that it was pretty hard, actually, to put any individual person in either one of those boxes, either that the society was entirely responsible for that person's plight, or that the person herself was entirely responsible for her situation. It was a mixture. It was quite a complex mixture, actually, of bad choices and bad fortune, of roads not taken and roads cut off by chance or circumstance, mistakes, dropping out of school, having a child out of wedlock, doing drugs, getting in trouble with the law, not learning skills, not showing up to work on time or at all. And yet, many of these personal disabilities were the products of being badly parented, badly schooled, badly housed in neighborhoods where the horizons of possibility are so close at hand that they 
blind people even to their own imaginations of what might be possible for them. So the myth and the anti-myth coexist in these families. And of course, they describe the political discourse, if you want to call it that, or stalemate when we think about poverty. Conservative Republicans tend to see the individual and the family as the source of the problems. Liberal Democrats tend to see the society as the source of the problems. And I would like to see the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Republicans, each of whom has their own pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, sit down at the same table and put all those pieces out on the table and assemble them. And then they would have a full picture of the full range of the problems of poverty that families face. It's not a culture of poverty, as Oscar Lewis, the anthropologist, said in the 1950s, although his term has been taken and distorted, often by the right, as a way of condemning people who are poor to their own fate. I, I didn't find poverty be a, to be a culture. I don't think it's a, a set of mores and, and, and rituals and values that's transmitted from generation to generation. Poverty looked more to me like an ecological system of interactions between individuals and families and their environments of schools, neighborhoods, the private sector, government services, and the like. And the question is to describe this ecology and think about how it might be changed. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the people I encountered who demonstrated the, the complex and sometimes counterintuitive chain reactions from problem to problem to problem. A boy with asthma came into the pediatrics department at the Boston Medical Center. He was having a lot, he was having a lot of attacks that were forcing him to miss a lot of school and forcing his mother to miss a lot of work to bring him to the doctor. Research in the last 20 to 30 years has demonstrated that housing conditions can often exacerbate asthma. And the incidence of asthma among children in the United States has risen dramatically, especially among poor children. But when apartments contain dust mites, mold, dampness, roaches that shed their skin into a fine dust that's breathed in, it can cause asthma attacks. So the doctors who treated this boy realized that they could prescribe the steroid inhalers and so forth that are standard. And yet, when he went back to his apartment, when they asked the mother about the conditions, they realized that he was going to be back in the clinic again the next week and the next week and the next week. So they sent a nurse to the apartment who looked at the heavy drapes and the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and, and realized that they were probably full of dust mites, which were very difficult to get rid of. And there was a leaky pipe that was creating dampness and mold. So she wrote a letter to the landlord asking him to take up the carpet. The, the mother took down the drapes. She could do that. Take up the carpet, fix the pipe. No reply. So the lawyer at the pediatrics department of the Boston Medical Center made two calls to the landlord. And miraculously, the, the carpet was taken up, the leak was fixed, and after some weeks, the boy recovered got back to school regularly, the mother was back at work regularly, didn't lose her job, a lawyer at the pediatrics department. The pediatrics department at the Boston Medical Center now has five full-time lawyers who are paid by charitable donations because the pediatrician, Barry Zuckerman, who heads the department, understands that lawyers are as important as doctors in treating disease among the poor who live in terrible housing conditions. He's also got staff there who negotiate their ways through the labyrinth of welfare and food stamp and other benefits for which people are eligible but are not signed up. So trying to get them the assistance that the law permits them. Now, this interaction between housing and health can have some very serious consequences for people. And by the way, the Boston Medical Center, with a grant from the Kellogg Foundation, has started up a whole facilitating program to form medical legal partnerships all over the country. And there are now about 75 such partnerships. Not all include full-time attorneys. Some of them are 
use attorneys who do pro bono work without being paid and so forth. But it's a growing phenomenon, and one that Zuckerman thinks is important because he feels lawyers have more access to the political system than doctors do and might be able to actually make change in public policy. But the point here is to see the interactions. Uh, I got to know a single mother in New Hampshire who uh, was working for the state of New Hampshire uh, as a, an employee or, a, or, a, or a, I don't know what her title was, I can't remember, custodian or assistant in a group home for mentally ill adults run by the state. She was making $8.21 an hour. She had medical insurance. But with that low wage, she could not save anything. Every dime that came in went out. She had a son who had asthma. And because she had very little money, she had to move into an old drafty house after which her son's asthma got worse. Twice he had to be rushed by ambulance to the hospital. And for reasons that she was never able to sort out, her insurance company paid for the emergency room, but not for the ambulance charges, which amounted to $240 one time, $250 the next. So she had to pay them, and she couldn't, not all at once. So that debt went on her credit report. And when she tried to buy a mobile home to improve her housing, she couldn't get a loan. And when she had to replace her old car, which she needed to get to work, a reputable dealer ran a credit check and said, I'm sorry, I can't sell you a car because I can't make you a loan. So she ended up at a sleazy used car lot that didn't do credit checks, but charged her 15 and 3 quarters percent for a car loan. That was when rates were a little higher. She paid it because she needed the car. And she told me about this the same day that I happened to get in the mail an unsolicited offer for a car loan at half that interest rate which illustrates a very important point. When people borrow money, they're like corporations that borrow money. The higher their financial rating, the healthier they are financially, the lower interest they pay. So a corporation floats bonds that are rated AAA, they're gonna be paying a lower interest than a lower rated company. And the folks we're talking about here are not rated AAA. They pay higher fees on their credit cards, they pay higher fees on their mortgages if they can get them on their car loans. They pay late fees, they pay check cashing fees, they pay all kinds of fees that those of us who are fortunate enough to have a decent balance in the bank never face. As one kid said to his mother when she was poring over her checkbook one day, gee mom, being poor is very expensive. There one of the things I discovered in the course of, of spending time with these folks is that housing, which in, in the case of the woman I just mentioned, led to a health problem, which led to a car, higher car payment. Housing is more than a place to live. It's a key link in a chain reaction of events. And housing can contribute to malnutrition among children. Now, this happens in a very straightforward way, actually. All you have to do is kind of think about it for a minute. How rents have gone up very, very steeply in many parts of the country, to the point where a working family at low income, maybe that doesn't have any housing subsidies, isn't in public housing, doesn't have Section 8 vouchers, which can be used to help pay privately owned housing, a family like that may be paying 50 to 70 percent of their income for rent. Now, rent's not optional. You have to pay that every month. You've got to make the car payment every month. We have a very poor public transportation system in the United States. People who work generally have to get there by automobile. So you've got to pay the rent, you've got to pay the car payment, you've got to pay the electric bill. Those can't be squeezed. What can be squeezed in the family budget? food, and that's what people squeeze. Food stamps do not cover a full month's food, maybe two weeks, maybe three, if you can really work it well. And what's happening is, I spent some time in a couple of malnutrition clinics talking to parents who brought in their underweight children, is that they just don't have enough money for food very often. Now, there are a lot of reasons for malnutrition besides a lack of money, which we can go into later if you want to explore it after 
I finish, but money is certainly an important factor. And a study was done a couple of years ago of 12,000 low-income families in six states that found a high correlation between the lack of housing subsidies and underweight children. So here we have a situation where seemingly very unrelated, disparate problems, high housing costs and the lack of government subsidies, can, can contribute to a problem that if it affects kids in the first two to three years of life, when brain development is at its most crucial, can have lifelong consequences and produce lifelong cognitive impairment. Because it's been shown that even if nutrition is restored in later years, the early deficit is not overcome. Now, uh, the head of one of the malnutrition clinics, pediatrician Debbie Frank, said very simply you know, about, about school children who come to hung school hungry, she said, you know, learning is a discretionary activity. It doesn't happen until you're well fed. I met teachers who teach at inner city schools who would take granola bars to class. And when they saw the vacant look of hunger in students' eyes, they'd toss them a granola bar. If kids don't have adequate health care, and you know the House failed today to override Bush's veto on the S-chip program, if they, if they need eyeglasses, can't see the board, if they have a toothache, I mean, you've had toothaches. I'm sure a lot of us have toothaches. You don't think about anything else. It's very hard to learn when you have health problems. If you miss a lot of school, you fall behind. When you fall behind, you don't understand a lot of what the teacher is saying. Debbie, who was a teacher, suggested that I ask students what percentage of the time do they not understand what's going on in class. And the answers were stunning, 20, 40, 50 percent of the time. So then I'd say, well, what do you do if you don't understand? And, and the kids would say things like, well, Miss Jones will explain it to us, but uh, Mr. Bates, you know, he's mean and he just tells us we should be paying attention. Now, I was, you know, I was never loved school, but I'll tell you, I, I can't imagine sitting in class all day, five days a week, not understanding half of what is going on in a classroom. And kids who are malnourished, who have a cognitive impairment, are very often in exactly that kind of situation. Do they stay in school? Do they finish high school? Or do they drop out? Well, a lot of them drop out. So you see the interconnections here. It seems odd when you first think that poor housing conditions can contribute to malnutrition, can contribute to learning problems, can contribute to dropping out of high school. And what is the effect of dropping out of high school? Well, if, if, if morality isn't enough of an argument, consider the cost to society. A couple of uh, researchers uh, did a little cal some calculations uh, in which they figured that a high school dropout earns about $260,000 less over a lifetime than a graduate and pays about $60,000 less in taxes. That uh, the average 45-year-old high school dropout is in worse health than the average 65-year-old high school graduate. The high school dropouts have a much higher chance of getting in trouble with the law and going to prison. And so, it seems pretty clear that the less we invest in children now, the more we will have to invest in prisons later. These are interconnected issues. Connect the dots. Now, there are a lot of what some people would call internal problems that many people in poverty have. One of them is a deep sense of incapacity of incapability. I, I spent time in a, one, one night with a, a group of, of recovering drug, drug addicts who were living in Washington, D.C. in a halfway house. They had been through drug treatment, and their job now was to get jobs. They were supposed to be out there looking for work. And these men sat around a couple of times a week as a support group talking about their experience of looking for work. Now, these were tough guys. They'd survived the crack wars in D.C. Uh, some of them had lived on the streets. A couple had been in prison. The last emotion that I would have imagined they're expressing to each other 
much less to anyone else, was the, exactly the emotion they were feeling as they were looking for work, fear. Fear was the word they used most often. They were afraid to apply for jobs. They were afraid of being asked about their police records. They were afraid of being rejected. And a couple even said they were afraid of being hired into jobs they did not think they could do. I spent some time at a couple of Los Angeles housing projects where there was a job placement program, and I asked the staff what the obstacles were to people getting work. All the staff members independently put fear near the top of the list. People in the housing projects wanted to work, but they were afraid to go outside into the larger working world which they didn't feel they understood and didn't think they could survive very well in. They wanted jobs with the housing authority in the projects. That's where they felt most comfortable. Although these projects were centers of gang and drug activity where I was advised not to go interview after dark, that's where people felt most at home, most at ease, most comfortable, and that's where they wanted to work. I spent some time in a, a job training center where people coming in to the program, many of them had trouble even having a conversation. So defeated were they, having failed in school, in relationships, in job after job. They looked at the floor, mumbled, and the training program treated that problem along with the hard skills. And so one of the instructors was a retired Marine Corps sergeant. A lot of tough love. He'd get people to stand up in front of the group every morning and give a little talk extemporaneously. I can't hear you. Look at me. He'd structure the course, which was in office skills involving computer work, so that everyone had at least a small success every day. And it was remarkable to see what happened to folks. Little by little, step by step, their eyes came up off the floor, their voices gained clarity, and they ended up, most of them, getting fairly decent jobs, in fact, or jobs with promotional possibilities. One of the people I got to know there was a woman who said that I should call her Peaches in the book. She was homeless at the time, living in a shelter at night. She was coming to this job training program. She'd been terribly abused as a child in a foster family, called all kinds of horrible names, and told me she thought so little of herself that when she had to steal for food, she never stole anything good, like a steak. She didn't think she was entitled to that. She stole packages of bologna and so forth. In fact, it's odd that, that we call the programs for people in poverty entitlements because I didn't find anybody at all who felt entitled to anything. People tend to blame themselves. They've internalized the larger society's views. They've internalized the American myth. If they don't succeed, it's their fault. One woman in Cleveland, when I asked her how she got to this point, she said, lazy, lazy, I'm lazy. I said, lazy, you get up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock every morning to go to work on an assembly line at a bakery doing a job I don't think I could do for half an hour. You work harder than I do. Why do you think of yourself as lazy? And she couldn't articulate it, except to point to a few mistakes she'd made along her way, mistakes whose consequences seemed to her to be irreversible because she felt powerless. Now, I told, uh, I talked to employers, and I heard from employers, complaint after complaint about people getting hired and then not showing up to work, not calling in when they couldn't come, and that sort of thing. And I, I took this uh, information to um, a woman in New Hampshire, who uh, Ann Brash, who was extremely perceptive on all of this because she had grown up in the middle class and fell into poverty after a divorce. And I said, Ann, I'm hearing this from employers. What do you say? She said, maybe people don't think they're important enough for anybody to care if they come to work. I took that back to a, a few of the employers and it was like the old cartoons of light bulbs going on off over people's heads. Yeah, that made sense. The one young man in Cleveland who's the third generation of a family that owns a manufacturing company, they make hydraulic and fuel hoses for industrial machinery, said, well, he said, this fits with what my, I think it was his grandfather, 
said, he said, you, you know, when you take over, you're going to have to turn your collar around, be like a priest, and minister to your workers. So when somebody doesn't show up to work and doesn't call, he'll call them at home and say, how come you're not here? And if the guy says, well, my car broke down, he'll send someone to pick him up and bring him in to get the idea across that he needs it. Otherwise, he's going to miss a production deadline. He's going to have to pull people off another job. This is rare in business. It's rare. But it understands something about people's sense of deep inadequacy that's very hard to overcome. And one of the problems that I found to my surprise, and I didn't expect it, and I didn't ever ask anybody about it, was childhood abuse. Most poor households in America are headed by single adults, and most of them are women. And most of the women I interviewed told me they had been sexually abused as children by their fathers or their stepfathers or their mother's boyfriends or the older siblings in a foster family. I didn't ask this question. I would say, tell me about your childhood. And it would come out sometimes in the first interview, sometimes later. It was very difficult for me at first to understand why they were telling this, talking about such an intimate trauma to a perfect stranger and until I began to understand that it was probably because I was a stranger, that I didn't know their families, and that they felt that it was at the center of what had gone wrong with it for them. Many of them said they could not form lasting attachments with men. They didn't trust men, no surprise. That they felt extremely vulnerable and powerless when their mothers would not protect them, and so forth. Now, I would never argue that sexual abuse is more prevalent among lower socioeconomic families than among the affluent. I don't think we have good data on this. People are reluctant to, to report it. I, I have a feeling it cuts across class lines. I do know, though, that if you don't have the money to buy therapy and counseling and get professional help, you probably have less chance of recovery doesn't mean that all therapy uh, is going to help and solve problems, and it doesn't mean that you can't recover without it. But when you feel completely isolated and alone and don't have the wherewithal, you certainly are at a disadvantage. And for many people, this is a trauma, and the reactions are uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome very often. Uh, there can be an emotional cutoff, which is protective, but it's exactly the wrong kind of thing to be a good parent, which involves the need to be emotionally accessible and trusting. So these disabilities can carry over generation to generation very often with no way out because of a lack of wherewithal and knowledge that will afford treatment. You know, uh, this is a remarkably greedy society that we live in. We, we're told all the time by our politicians, some of them at least, that we want the money we earn is ours, we want to keep it in our own pockets and whatnot. We, are, we have ostentatious wealth. The disparities uh, are dramatic. Uh, you know, in, in, in 2004, the Federal Reserve did a study, I think they do it every three years, that showed that the top 10% of the American households had a net worth that had grown and was averaging uh, 3.1 million per household, the top 10%. But the bottom 25% net worth had declined to minus 1,400 on average. It's one quarter of American households owed more than they owned. One quarter. This is an enormous disparity. Uh, and one that's exacerbated by the lack, the decline of labor unions. We have now in the overall about 12.5% of American workers are in unions, lowest since the Depression. Government, it's you know, 35, 36%, but in the private sector, only 7.9% of American workers belong to unions, which means we almost don't have unions in the United States. There's a bill that's been in Congress for several sessions that would facilitate union organizing at the workplace. Some Northeastern Republicans favor it, 
but by and large, it's not the, uh, the ma Republican majority for, for all those sessions certainly was, wasn't going to pass it. And I don't know what it's, I, I think it's been reported out of committee in the House now. I'm not quite, quite sure where it stands, but chances are Bush will, will veto it. Although it seems to me that it's ideologically inconsistent because if you believe in a free market, you really need to have a level playing field between buyer and seller. I mean, if I go into a Middle Eastern market and I want to buy a rug and there are rug merchants and we negotiate about the price and I could walk away and he could say no. We're on an even footing. But in the labor market at low skilled levels in the United States, except in a booming economy, which we don't have, the seller of labor is at a disadvantage. And the buyer of labor really has uh, much more power. So this is not a free market now, it's a rigged market because workers cannot bargain collectively for their wages. So that's, that's part of the, the issue. Um, I, I was having dinner a, a year, year and a half ago with, with a guy I know in Birmingham, Alabama. He lives in a very posh suburb and I was telling him about having visited some inner city schools where they didn't have enough textbooks for the kids. And as a, as a math teacher in LA said to me, if you don't have a textbook for every student, you don't have a textbook for any students. You can't give them to some and not others. So teachers end up Xeroxing chapters. Some schools have limits on how many pages a, a week you can Xerox. And these, these teachers may have 135 kids, you know, five sections of 25 kids each or whatever. And uh, they spend their own money going to Kinko's and doing that kind of thing. And this guy was amazed. He said, you know, my kids have two textbooks for each class, so they don't have to carry them back and forth between home and school. The disparities are enormous in this country. But the odd thing is that alongside the greed is a very powerful current of generosity in America. We have, as uh, you know, the uh, uh, de Tocqueville noticed a long time ago, and is still the case, probably the most uh, active philanthropy uh, in the world of any country. I mean, those of you who pay full tuition at Dartmouth cover maybe 55% of the cost of educating you. Full tuition, because of the endowment, generosity of, of alumni and so forth, grants and so forth. Now, this place couldn't operate without philanthropy. Not, certainly not the way it does. So, I mean, look at the reaction after the tsunami, the outpouring of, of giving that came from the United States. Look at the reaction after Katrina, the donations, the people who put refugees from New Orleans up in their homes in churches and so forth. There was enormous generosity on display. And I kept running into this all over the place. Uh, a Walmart in, in Claremont, whose manager said they were having a meeting of employees one day and he announced that one of the employees, he didn't name who, was going to have a tough Christmas. And the workers put in a dollar or two each until <coughs> three or four hundred dollars had been collected. And one of the people who contributed was the worker who was being helped. And you know, you could say, well, Walmart could do a lot more for its workers than collect their hard-earned money, but that displayed a tremendous spirit of giving among people who didn't really have a lot of cushion to give. Uh, Tom and Kara King, a couple uh, who lived in Newport, New Hampshire, uh, were, were remarkable people. I mean, Kara had cancer. And you know, when they went to sit in the waiting room, they noticed that you know, there were kids there and the, there weren't any toys for the kids to play with. So, Tom and Kara were very poor. They were out of work when I met them, both of them. Uh, so, but they got their kids, their three kids, to go through their toys and pick out toys they were willing to donate to the waiting room. And Tom, who's kind of a carpenter, made a, made a toy box and everything. And they took it and they gave it and they put it in this waiting room. Uh, when Kara found out she had to have a bone marrow transplant, they took what little money they had and decided to treat themselves to a dinner out. And they went to a truck stop and took the kids and they sat at a table talking, laughing. The, the two boys got into a contest to see who could eat more. 
And uh, when it came time to pay the bill, the waitress said, it's been taken care of. I said, what are you talking about? It's been paid for. And they were a little put out, actually, because uh, uh, they didn't really like charity. And, and Kara especially hated to be pitied. She hated it. And all the way home in the car, she was stewing about this and getting angrier. And so she got home, she picked up the phone and called the diner and got the waitress and said, who paid our bill? The waitress said, well, he's still here, and handed the phone to a guy who explained that he was a truck driver just passing through, didn't get home to see his family much, and couldn't help overhearing snatches of their conversation. He said, you know, I counted. Your children told you they loved you 20 times. Uh, Kara broke down, stopped being mad. But I always thought of Kara as having a, an internal balance sheet. Every time anybody did something good for her, it went on the debit side. She had to do something good for somebody else. Uh, she died not too long after that, leaving Tom as a widower with three kids. So, generosity. We do have it here. The question is how to harness it. So I, I want to put a question to you that I've asked all over the country. You know, the inter let me just preface this by just saying that, that the interaction between the private and the public sector is at the center of of our ongoing political debate. It happens all the time. I mean, Bush has said he doesn't want to sign this big increase in uh, the, student, uh, the, the state children's health insurance program because he's afraid it's going to woo families away from private insurance when they can get government insurance. Uh, the Democrats say these folks can't afford the private insurance. So this is part of our discussion and debate. But let me ask you this. How many of you would be personally willing to pay higher income taxes to help address the problem of poverty? Let's see the hands. Well, this is an overwhelmingly large uh, yes response. Of course, this is a biased sample. You, instead of, well, I guess you're going to have time to watch the, uh, the Cleveland-Boston game, actually, even after this. But you're making a sacrifice to come here. Listen to now, How many of you who raised your hands have told elected officials that you were willing to pay higher taxes. Let's see how many of those there are. Very few. See, that's the gap, isn't it? That's the gap. The politicians don't think anybody wants to pay higher taxes. I, I had a conversation with John Edwards about this uh, first time I met him, you know, and I said, well, um, you know, I've been getting this response all over the country. And he looked at me as if I were crazy, because he understood that raising taxes is the third rail of a political campaign. And it is. He's right. But I think that people are much more willing to do this than political leaders give us credit for. And you sit here with a very unusual opportunity to make this point to presidential candidates, all of whom come through here. And so when you go to these candidate forums, those of you who raised your hands, and that was almost all of you, put it on the agenda. Ask the question. Make the candidates talk about poverty, government's role in it, taxes, and all of these issues. Because unless you do, they're going to think nobody's interested. John Edwards is the only one who really consistently talks about this issue. Most of the others don't. And in the general election campaign, you won't see it mentioned. I guarantee poverty will not be talked about. I mean, assuming Edwards doesn't get the nomination, which it doesn't look as if he's going to. So you have a really unusual opportunity to put items on the agenda that you're concerned about but don't get talked about very much. And as you do, I hope you'll remember to connect the dots. Thank you very much. David. Uh, we'll take questions now, and is our, as is our practice, uh, we'll give priority to students. And I will also remind that after we conclude, there will be a book signing uh, by David Shipler. So who would like to uh, begin the questions? Yeah, 
right here. Well, would, you, would you stand up because it's a little hard to hear? Um, I think the problem between uh, something getting done and people's willingness to pay to fix poverty and you know, fight for human rights and universal health care and such is that people don't know how the money's going to be used and what the solution to the problem is um, you know, if you can do something in an accountable way. So I was wondering if you had any insight on what well, I, I think you're absolutely right. And Debbie's parents used to put on the top of their tax returns uh, for use in the national parks only, which I think was probably, <laughs> you could try that, I guess. Um, I've often wondered what would happen if each of us, you know, on the tax return, were given a list of basic categories where we wanted our taxes to go, how it would really come out. Now, uh, you're absolutely right, and I, and I think this is uh, uh, obviously, even for those who are willing to pay more and concerned about this issue, you know, a, a major problem. The only thing I can say is to, you got to uh, communicate to the elected representatives your views on it. You got to, you know, there needs to be a lot of organization on this issue. And there's room also, besides government spending, for more activity in the private sector and in philanthropy. There are, there are really good organizations all over the country that are working very hard on any poverty issues. Uh, there is a feeling among uh, the people who run Teach for America, for example, that if uh, people, and I know Dartmouth's application percentages to that program are quite high, that if people do that for a couple of years, even if they don't end up being teachers professionally, if they go to law school or get their MBAs or go to med school or whatever, they will never forget that experience. They will always carry that with them and that that experience will shape their professional activities. So, you know, there are many ways of getting at this issue. Uh, government is one of them, and, and advocating government programs and voting for candidates and making the candidates talk about these issues and think about them, I think is a very important aspect, but it's not the only way to go, of course. Thank you. C could you hear that? Uh, that's good. I'm glad you could. But I, where is the shelter? Where is it located? In White River. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing? Can I ask? A, I'm sorry. Are you seeing an increase in uh, homeless people in the last couple of years, or not necessarily, or decrease? Yes, we're seeing an increase both for a family homeless shelter. Um, we're seeing an increase. And, and are a lot of these people working um, or not? Yeah, yeah. It, when it's a single parent, it's a bit tricky. Um, so we see a lot of single parents. Um, and if they can have extra daycare, usually, or if the kids are old enough. I would say maybe 50% of the people are Are 50% of the people in the shelter are working? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, right here. Can you speak up? Because I bet people in the back can't hear you. There's a very Uh, the question was about illegal immigration and whether I spoke to any illegal immigrants for my book and whether I thought they should be deported or, or normalized or, you know. Uh, yes, I have two chapters about uh, immigrants. Some of them were illegal, some not. Um, and 
uh, what <laughs> a couple of things that are worth observing. The, uh, there are certain sectors, and I'm not an economist, so I, get, I, I can't give you a really definitive picture of the impact of illegal immigration on the overall economy, but I can just tell you anecdotally that um, there were sectors of the economy that probably couldn't function without illegal immigrants. For example, agriculture. And you've seen, in fact, uh, farmers in California and some other parts of the country with the crackdown on the border having insufficient labor to pick their crops. Farmers in, in eastern North Carolina, where I uh, spent a little time, told me that without the Mexicans coming in illegally, there was no way they could grow what they were growing. They'd have to switch to crops that could be harvest, harvested mechanically. It means you know, greens, tomatoes, stuff like that, they couldn't do. Now, uh, in the garment district in Los Angeles, uh, which really is like a third world uh, industry in many cases, because people are paid on a piecework basis to sew clothes together, uh, that, that relies a lot on, on undocumented workers. Although in the case of LA, if they didn't have any undocumented workers, there would be, uh, people with green cards or with, uh, with US citizenship who could probably come in and, and fill those jobs. Eastern North Carolina, I mean, I don't know if any of you are from Eastern North Carolina, but uh, there ain't nothing there. I mean, there are just no people to work in the fields. So it's migrant labor that they start in Florida, they come north, and they end up in the fall harvesting apples up, up here. Uh, so it's not, I don't think, you know, from my, view, it, it's, they're not taking jobs away from Americans. They're actually doing jobs that are essential to the economy. And in other areas too, in urban areas as well, there are a lot of construction work, work that's done by undocumented immigrants. Uh, and it, it seems to me that um, while it may depress wages, certainly, where, there's, uh, where there's, there's a supply of alternative workers, uh, by and large, these folks are working and they're coming to work, and they're sending money back home. Uh, so it's, I think here we have a clash between the economic laws and the immigration laws. I mean, I remember a few years ago in Maine, hearing on the radio two news stories, one after the other. The first was that it was gonna be a bumper blueberry crop that summer, big deal for Maine. Second story, the state police and the immigration authorities had set up checkpoints on the Maine tur turnpike to intercept Worker, migrant workers coming to pick the blueberry crop. And this is like we're working against ourselves. So the one thing I actually think that Bush has tried to do constructively is that uh, in, in this area is his combination of you know, stricter enforcement and um, worker visas. Now there are lots of problems with the particular proposal that he made on the visas. Uh, you, you gotta make it easy enough for people to take that route rather than you know, paying a coyote to smuggle them in. Uh, it's gotta be easier to do it legally than illegally. It's gotta be less risky to do it legally than illegally. And unfortunately, what's happened in this country, especially since 9-11, uh, but not just since 9-11, is that people who present themselves to the immigration agency to try to normalize their visas if they come up in the computer as having overstayed or being here illegally, they're usually immediately arrested, put in a jail, and it could be a federal holding jail, but very often it's a county jail with common criminals. They're often left there for, for months at a time while some bureaucracy slowly grinds to do the deportation paperwork, and then they're deported. But it's a pretty miserable thing. I've, I've visited a jail in Virginia a couple of times where Pregnant women are locked up with common criminals because they were undocumented and they were caught. It's, it's not a, the kind of thing that we want to be doing in this country and we don't have the mechanism either bureaucratically or legally to deal in a sensible way with the issue. So. Yep. Uh. How do you sort of respond or suggest that the country responds to a decision like the s chip veto? I mean, basically, like, that children from working class poor aren't going to have any health insurance. Like, the issues like asthma, I think, like, diabetes, even obesity 
are increasing in, in like children of working class, poor families? Like, how do you sort of suggest that we move forward from a decision like that? Uh, what was the last sentence? I didn't... How, how do you suggest we move forward from a decision like that? Uh, we being the, the American public or the members of Congress. I mean, I, I think what's going to happen, and Bush has indicated that you know, a negotiated compromise will emerge because I have the sense that Republicans, and many Republicans, of course, supported this bill, I mean, and they're not you know, moderate Republicans, you know, Orrin Hatch, I don't think you'd consider him, I think you'd consider him pretty conservative, uh, among others. I think they sense the political dynamite here for them that there is a, uh, a campaign issue that's being generated, and perhaps the Democrats have done it intentionally. They've you know, wanted to increase this program extensively enough that it, you know, it forces the issue. But uh, my guess is they'll come to some compromise on how much money will be allocated. You know, one of the problems with this program and others is that a lot of people who are eligible don't get it. And so one of the purposes, as I understand it, I haven't read this bill, so I'm, I may be a little off, but as I understand it, one of the purposes is to do outreach to families that are not getting S-CHIP but are eligible for it. And that would actually increase the number of poor kids who are in the program. Uh, you know, an indicator of how artificially low the poverty line is, this $20,549 that I mentioned for family of four, is that many states put the eligibility level at 200% of poverty or 250% of poverty or even 300% of poverty for some of these programs, SCHIP being one of them. So it's not, uh, it's not a, the, the kind of thing that is being ignored. The, the political power structure is engaged with it. Uh, and it seems to me that you know, they'll probably work out some kind of a, Compromise because I think there are enough Republicans who are saying to the president, "Hey, you know, don't don't hand the Democrats a campaign issue here. You know, let's defuse this." But I would add, actually, <coughs> one other thing about health insurance. Uh, you know, it's crazy for Americans to get their health insurance through their places of employment. Now, it's an anachronistic system. We don't get our car insurance through our workplaces. Why should we get our health insurance there? Our employers have nothing to do with health insurance, shouldn't have nothing to do with health insurance. Uh, business executives are beginning now to see that their own interest is, lies in some kind of universal health care. A few business executives quietly talking about this. I mean, the head of Walmart and the head of the Service Employees International Union had a joint press conference about this. They differed on the solution. But I think that uh, businesses are really, the ones who offer health insurance are really being killed. Because, I mean, I've talked to businessmen who tell me, well, you know, I, I, everybody I hire, I have to figure another 30 to 35% on top of the wage for benefits. Uh, and that means that I'm gonna hire very reluctantly, very reluctantly and very carefully because I cannot control health insurance premiums. I can control my wage that I pay. But I can't control the premiums. They go up and up and up every year. Uh, so what am I going to do? I'm going to transfer them to the workers more and more, or I'm going to drop it entirely. You just saw GM and the uh, United Auto Workers completely changing the basis on which the retired employee's health insurance is, is managed, shifting it to a trust that's going to be managed basically by the union. Uh, this is an enormous change. I think it puts companies, American companies, at a disadvantage with their overseas competitors who by and large exist in countries that have national health insurance. And therefore, they don't have to pay. Now, of course, taxes might be higher and so forth, but nevertheless, uh, it's not in, I don't think it's in the interest of American business not to have people properly covered. Uh, just as I don't think it's in the interest of American business to have a large segment of the labor force undereducated, uh, having poor skills, that makes them uh, not competitive in a ruthlessly competitive global marketplace. So if you talk to business executives who think past the next quarter's earnings report, and most of them admit to me that, that I've talked to that they don't, but if they think 20 years or 25 years 
into the future, they have to think about universal health insurance, uh, about more public investment in education, more vocational training, and all of the other issues that will actually help people who are the working poor. Uh, way in the back. Um, earlier you mentioned the supply and demand. Can you hear me? Barely. Uh, earlier you mentioned the supply and demand of labor, and you said the employers um, or the demanders have the advantage. I was just wondering if you could talk more about that, how they have the advantage. About who has the advantage? You said the employers have the advantage. Oh, yes, employers have the advantage in a, in a, in a labor market. Well, of course, it depends on, <coughs> excuse me, it depends on the level you're talking about. But when you're talking about low-skilled workers uh, who are uh, seen as pretty dispensable, that is, uh, you can get, you know, if somebody doesn't show up, you know, you're going to be irritated and annoyed, but you can get someone else to do the same job eventually. Uh, the worker really has no bargaining power. I mean, if, if you go to and apply for a job at Walmart, they're going to tell you how much they're going to pay you. And uh, if you want more, then you're going to have to go somewhere else to try to get more. And at, at that skill level, you probably aren't going to be able to get paid more. Now, the free market is an ingenious mechanism. Ken and I were both in Moscow, he for many more years than I was there. I was there for four years. So believe me, neither of us is a socialist. We've seen the, the calamity of socialism. I'm a big fan of private enterprise. But it's not a perfect system uh, unfettered. It needs management and some regulation. The private market, the private labor market now at low skill levels is one-sided in many sectors because there are too many workers of low skill and too few jobs at, at those skill levels. So employers can, can tell them how much they're going to pay them and pay them probably a lot less than they ought to be paid given the importance of the work that they do. The only way in this kind of situation, now in a booming economy, and one of the advantages I ha happened to have it was accidental when I was working on this book, was that I started off at a time when the economy was really booming and ended up in a kind of mild recession. So I could sort of see the, the changes. Most of the people I interviewed and spent time with didn't see their standards of living change much. But I did see changes in the way employers treated workers. In the boom economy, when workers were in demand, employers were much more accommodating, not necessarily in wages, but in other areas. Uh, they were concerned about turnover, for example. I mean, one company I went to in, in uh, Akron is a plastics manufacturer. They make plastic pots for plants you buy at the nursery. People were starting, I think, around, as I recall, $7 an hour or something like that, seven fifty dollars maybe. The work conditions I didn't think were, it was a modern factory, but I didn't think the work conditions were too great. Uh, first of all, the air it was loud and noisy. People did wear ear protectors. But the dust was, f the air was full of plastic dust, which uh, OSHA decided was just a nuisance, not a health hazard, so much for regulation. Uh, and people were doing mind-numbing jobs, you know, counting uh, you know, plastic pots as they came off the conveyor belt putting them in boxes and that sort of thing. And there was a high turnover. The manager said they were concerned about the high turnover. So they started doing exit interviews, and they asked people why they were leaving. And the people didn't say because of the low wage, because of the plastic dust in the air, because of the noise, because of the mind-numbing work. They said, nobody cared about me. Nobody paid any attention to me, which was really pretty interesting. So the factory instituted a system of assigning a new worker to a more seasoned worker. And if the new worker stayed three months, at least the seasoned worker got 100 bucks. Uh, unfortunately, this, I, don't know how, I don't think this lasted very long. The, f the manager left, and, and the economy you know, kind of tanked. So the company didn't really have to be quite as accommodating. So I think that you know, in, a, in a sort of time of, um, of, of economic uh, downturn or mild recession or even a kind of flat, you know, or bare, you know, bare, bare economic growth, 
you really don't see uh, a level playing field. And the only way workers can get higher wages is to bargain collectively through a union. Uh, otherwise, you know, they don't, employers don't have to pay them more. And, you know, I asked this Walmart manager in Claremont, I said, well, what would happen if you paid your workers a higher salary? And I gave him a number, I can't remember it at this point. <laughs> and I expected him to say we'd have to raise prices, and, but he didn't. Uh, he kind of thought for a while, and he said, well, I guess we'd have to, to you know, sort of do away with a lot of the decorations and balloons and stuff like that. I said, well, you mean your margin is big enough that you could raise starting wages and not hurt, uh, not have to raise prices? He said, no, we wouldn't raise prices because those are determined by what we perceive as uh, the market. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, I don't know the answer on sexual abuse. As I said, I, I suspect that this is a pandemic that's quite hidden and probably crosses socioeconomic lines. <laughs> I've never seen good data on it. If anybody has seen anything, I'd be very interested in it. Um, on self-esteem, uh, it seemed to me that uh, one of the contributors to low self-esteem was failure in school. That is, people who didn't do well in school or who dropped out didn't exactly feel great about themselves. Uh, even though they might sometimes put on a rather cavalier front about it. I mean, Tom King, for example, from Newport told me that you know, he dropped out of school because they weren't teaching him anything. And he was a mechanic and he, he wanted to learn how to you know, fix engines, which he can do. And you know, that's what he does. So uh, that's what he was doing, at least. I've been out of touch with him a while. So for him, education was a kind of, I thought, it, I always, I got to know him pretty well, and I kind of thought it was a rationalization. That, you know, he was putting down school because he didn't finish, and so he was sort of, he was saying, well, you know, it didn't do any good for me. What's the point of it? Uh, whereas other people were more openly regretful about having either not gone on to college, which now we preach that everyone should do, or not finishing high school, or be getting bad grades, and that sort of thing. Um, one problem, and this doesn't exactly go to your question of self-esteem, but one problem is, I think, that people uh, who finish high school even, or maybe have a year or two of college but don't finish the four-year degree, are really not equipped to be very competitive in the job market. And this country used to have a vocational school system that was pretty extensive. Uh, it, we've pretty much uh, done away with that. It, 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 they exist here and there. But really, there's no well-organized vocational training for people who finish their high school degrees. And part of this is the whole notion, which sounds very egalitarian, college for all. Well, that's great if everybody goes to college. But what happens to people who don't go to college? I mean, they fall through the cracks. And I think that because this co country, this society, values money and measures people's success largely on the basis of how much they earn, there is a connection between lack of education, which translates into lack of earning power, and self-esteem. I'll take two more questions. Yes, please. Um, It's a very good question. I, I encountered the same thing when I asked people where they put themselves in the sort of class hierarchy. Some people, of course, the word poor, the designation poor, has a stigma in American society uh, because of this notion that it's your <coughs> responsibility. And often people, I don't know if they say this to you, but even if they acknowledge that they have very low incomes, they'll talk about the richness of their lives in other ways, in family, in, in faith, and so forth. And that's legitimate very often. 
Um, it does kind of miss the point, though. I think it was Woody Allen, that great economist, who once said the, 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 the most uh, poverty is a real problem, especially from the financial point of view. And I think that uh, you know, the, the stigma that it has been internalized so that a lot of people, I mean, I found very few people who blame their situation on anybody but themselves. Uh, the larger society, the economic system, government programs, the school system were not on their radar, by and large, as causes. Uh, and it is, it's a problem. We were talking, a few of us at dinner, uh, uh, we're talking about the problem uh, that there's no movement in the United States among low-income people, uh, as there has been in other countries, Latin American countries, for example, and why was that? And, and there were a lot of reasons tossed around. But well, I think one of them is the sense that people don't want to be, don't want to be labeled this way and don't want the stigma. One more question. Can you already ask a question? No, good. You need to ask a question. Um, this is going back to the health care issue. Um, you talked about uh, poor, uh, poor health being linked to poverty. And I was wondering the extent to which you thought a more I do think so. Uh, you know, there, my daughter just had a baby in London and, and a big fan of the National Health Service because she had complications and she was seen very frequently in the hospital a week before she delivered. Uh, afterwards, uh, uh, you know, midwives came to her apartment uh, four times to visit and so forth and so on. I mean, it's unbelievable. She could get a doctor in the middle of the night on the phone. <laughs> it was all for not. She didn't pay a dime. Um, of course, Britain has poverty, so you have to sort of, and other countries with national health systems have poverty. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but it seems to me that we need to face some facts. I mean, I was told uh, by a political scientist who studies this that most dollars spent on health care in the United States now are federal dollars. If you add up the military, the VA, the uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and CHIP, you're already over 50%. Then if you throw in the tax deductions that corporations and self-employed people get for their premiums, you're you know, clearly uh, way up there. I mean, so the notion that government shouldn't pay for health care uh, is unrealistic. Government already pays most of our health care costs. The question is, how do they pay? Does government pay, is the money managed in the most uh, efficient way. And obviously, if a poor family or a poor person like the guy I mentioned who went to the emergency room to get dental treatment uh, isn't paying, then who pays? We pay. I pay. My health insurance premiums go up. Grants, research grants to teaching hospitals, you know, there's a portion called indirect costs, 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever it is, go into hospital maintenance, some of that money is used for uh, in health care for the indigent. I mean, if a poor person who, has, who is not on Medicaid, uh, a kid who's not on CHIP, walks into an emergency room, the doctors and nurses are not going off the clock when they treat that person. They're still being paid. So the notion that we're somehow avoiding government role by not having universal single-payer health insurance, I think is, is just uh, unrealistic. Now, I mean, there are a lot of problems with national health insurance programs. I'm sure that, I mean, I hope my daughter and her husband in London never have to go into other areas of national health service, because I'm sure there are areas that are not as good as the maternal area that they put a lot of money into. And, you know, there are, there are, there's a kind of rationing. You have to wait a long time for certain tests and scans and stuff like that. So, I mean, there are, no system is perfect, but uh, I, I just, I think there's enough concern about this in the United States now. There's more talk about it than there used to be. And I think the reason is very simple. The middle class is hurting. It's not just the poor now. In fact, the poor, if, if you get the benefits you're eligible for, you're covered. It's people, you know, in that, in that middle bracket who are falling through the cracks dramatically. And those folks vote. 
So the politicians are beginning to listen. Well, again, I will invite everyone up here to uh, get David to sign that book if you buy it. And thank you very, very okay. much. Thanks. Thanks.